jail and prison statistics. In local states, jails take and hold people who commit crimes and place them in lawful custody. Of which is called the jailhouse, and it consists of cell bars, that are known to defendants as confinement or lockup. Whereas defendants are convicted of minor offenses and some make bail and others cannot. Defendants who await trial for serious offenses are given options such as probation, the insanity plea, life sentences, or the death penalty, etc. The U.S. locks up more people per capita than any other nation. According to the U.S. criminal justice system statistics for 2018, America held an estimated 2.3 million people in 1,719 state prisons, 102 federal prisons, 1,852 juvenile correctional facilities, 3,163 local and 80 Indian country jails. As well as in military prisons, immigration detention facilities, civil commitment centers, state psychiatric hospitals and prisons in the U.S. territories. In 20 states, after completion of prison sentences, people convicted of sexual crimes are committed or detained in civil commitment centers. And for other policies, civil commitment centers, detention facilities, and psychiatric hospitals are being ignored or overlooked. Even though each state has taken action to reduce and reform the mass flow of incarceration, the U.S. has had more people detained before trial than most countries have in their jails and prisons combined. These government justice system agencies collect a lot of data. With each state handling its critical data separately, the data is too critical for the public or policymakers to know what's going on. Insanity defense or life sentences. The mental disorder defense known as the insanity defense excuses a person who has committed crimes from being a criminal to plead insanity. The argument is that he or she is incapable of being responsible for their actions, due to an episodic or persistent psychiatric disease at the time of the criminal act. Which makes the defendant less responsible for the excuse. An insanity defense means the person is either, gravely disabled or a danger to others and self. The idea that mentally ill people should not be held morally responsible for a crime committed dates back to 1754 BC during the Hammurabi of Babylonian. In Ireland, the United Kingdom, and the United States the defense is based on evaluations by forensic mental health professionals, they are considered to be the appropriate testers according to jurisdiction. A determination of sanity has to come from either a psychiatrist or psychologist. And the final decision of whether or not a defendant is insane will come from the judge and jury, who can take the evidence provided by experts into account when rendering a verdict. Some jurisdictions require the evaluation to address the defendant's ability to control their behavior at the time of the offense. Either the defendant is found to be competent or incompetent to stand trial. If the defendant is deemed incompetent there will be no trial, conviction, or acquittal. The defendant is then committed to a psychiatric facility for an indeterminate period. Majority of the cases, defendants deemed incompetent receives treatment until he is restored to competence, and then returns to court. Before 1972 defendants who were found incompetent to stand trial ended up institutionalized automatically and indefinitely. It was in 1972 when the United States Supreme Court ruled that such institutionalizations were unconstitutional. The American Psychiatric Association studies show on average, that defendants who are acquitted because of insanity are still confined to an institution for longer periods than those found guilty of similar crimes and are incarcerated in prison. Not all states offer the insanity defense. The five states where it isn't possible are Idaho, Kansas, Montana, Nevada, and Utah. Even though the latter's Supreme Court ruled the absence of an insanity defense is unconstitutional. The defendants are required to be found mentally competent to stand trial and understand the charges against them. Defendants can argue that they aren't guilty if a mental condition made it possible for them to commit the accused crime. While this may be a temporary mental state for a defendant in some jurisdictions. In 1979 the United States Court ruled that the insanity defense cannot be imposed upon an unwilling defendant if an intelligent defendant voluntarily wishes to forego the defense. The current insanity plea was built upon 1984 legislation. And the United States has 51 different types of insanity defenses, but every state and the federal government all have different legal definitions of this defense. Insanity Plea Statistics Statistics show that only 0.85% of cases have an insanity plea on behalf of a defendant. The plea of insanity is rare just as successful defenses, and it surrounds a lot of controversies. Successful determinations include, the quality of witness testimony, skills of the examiner, and whether or not the defendant does have a lack of personal responsibility. A person becomes too mentally disturbed when their compulsion or irrationality is impossible to control, and then they lack responsibility as a moral agent. However, when a state-appointed expert does find that defendants meet the legal definition of sanity, over 70% of them withdraw their plea. While an insanity plea requires a sort of test to determine legal sanity, only 12% of the laws support them. Bench trials are more likely to produce a successful insanity defense than jury trials. Felonies account for 94% of all insanity pleas, and only 5% of insanity pleas originate from an organic mental disorder. The insanity plea's primary reason is due to a substance abuse disorder of a defendant. 
defendants with affective, mental, or psychotic disorders are most likely to be acquitted due to an insanity defense. Defendants who have received more than five psychiatric hospitalizations are most likely to receive a not guilty because of insanity verdict. And defendants charged with sex crimes or who suffer from personality disorders are least likely to find success with an insanity plea. Schizophrenia diagnosis is the most likely reason a defendant would be found guilty of a crime with pleading insanity when psychiatric results are removed from the equation. With incidents of violence steadily increasing every year at home and abroad, less than 1% of insanity pleas are associated. The issue of sex crimes has become a controversial topic of discussion in the United States and around the world. Since a person who commits sex crimes would less likely be given the insanity defense, and are committed or detained in civil commitment centers. Most people are disturbed by this because sex crime defendants often end up back on the streets to commit worse crimes, and too there often are more victims. States' freedom to accept or not accept the insanity defense is just one controversial topic. Over half of the controversy surrounding insanity pleas and sex crimes is driven by assumptions. Which makes the topics appear misunderstood while lacking well-reformed facts. The validity of the Second Amendment rights is where topics of discussion generally turn towards. Another controversial topic, is people aren't receiving the treatment needed to get focused on personal behavior issues in a responsible and timely manner. To make mental health the overall plan for mental wellness. This only occurs mostly for people who can't afford to pay for the services. The general mental facility for people who can't afford renders an overworked staff and a less divine destiny after that. Not to include the government's mental health funding has been steadily decreasing. Making those patients feel less deserving and beaten down by the system's over-controlling tactics. People who can afford the services are sent to a more luxurious mental facility, where it doesn't affect their overall outlook on life. One can argue, more defendants can get the help they need if they would voluntarily surrender their responsibilities to a trained examiner. One can argue, the general facilities haven't been as effective during this lifetime. And these topics of discussion that surround the lack of proper mental wellness for criminals, are leading to the majority of them withdrawing their plea. While this appears to be a miscarriage of justice, it doesn't justify defendants getting out of a crime neither. People, in general, need to be more accountable for their actions, but this has to be taught at an early age. Such things as do not take what doesn't belong to you, and work hard to play hard. Respect others' belongings and privacy to earn respect, or otherwise, you are breaking laws. There are options if only the changes could be made during this next generation. Since general mental facilities render an overworked staff and a less divine destiny thereafter for patients. In all states, an insanity defense ought to be classified as a temporary mental state, and defendants ought to be constantly evaluated to continue an insanity defense. To leave more space for sex crimes defendants to get the help they need, and to keep those defendants off the streets. Some people argue that if laws were more consistent from state to state, the ability to predict insanity pleas would be adequate. One can argue, the laws of the justice system aren't fair, and probably never be with greed currently ruling the world. In my opinion, very few cases have an insanity plea on behalf of a defendant, and since this generation does have access to polygraph examiners, attorneys, forensic mental health professionals, judges, or even the jury ought to be given a polygraph examination either before or after trials to rule out any other deception. The defense would then be designed to ensure that the justice system is fairly administered. Only then court systems, councils, and juries would be more adequate, ruling out greed for science. Life sentence. A life sentence in prison is known as life imprisonment, and it is lifelong incarceration for a crime. Whereas convicted persons remain in prison until paroled, or the remaining part of their life. For such crimes as, arson aggravated cases, attempted murder, conspiracy to commit murder or murder, blasphemy, burglary, child abuse severe cases, crimes against humanity, criminal damage in English law, drug dealing, drug possession, drug trafficking, espionage, fraud severe cases, ethnic cleansing, financial crime severe cases, kidnapping, high treason or treason, human trafficking, rape, robbery which results in death or grievous bodily harm, aircraft hijacking, genocide certain cases, piracy, three strike law or three felonies, terrorism and war crimes all can land a person in prison a lifetime. Canada and some US states allow judges to impose life sentences for traffic offenses in certain cases if death was the result, of which it is possible to receive the maximum term. Life Sentence Statistics According to the US population of prison statistics in 2016, an estimated total of 206,268 people was serving a life or virtual life sentence. For a life sentence of 162,000, and life sentences of 50 years or more an additional 44,311. Although a mix of factors has led to the increase, those numbers represented 13.9% of the prison population. The prison population that was serving a de facto life sentence was 11% which were in Indiana, Louisiana, and Montana. Death in prison is more susceptible to prison inmates since states and the federal government are allowing long-term sentences. 
people serving life sentences have quadrupled since 1984 according to the findings. Overall 48.3% of life and virtual life sentenced individuals were one of five African American prisoners. Of the estimated 12,000 people who had been sentenced to life and virtual life for crimes that were committed as juveniles, 2,300 of them had been sentenced to life without parole. Convicted nonviolent crimes individuals with an LWP, LWOP, or virtual life sentence were more than 17,000. Statistics show that the U.S. is incarcerating people for life at higher rates than other nations with rates of 50 per 100,000. While federal and state levels have made some changes to their jurisdiction's policies in recent years, the controversy of states' prisoners still lingers. The policy changes are often small amounts and aren't ever enough. Do some researchers argue what to do with those who aren't criminally responsible, but are too dangerous to live in a society with little effective treatment? It takes an immense amount of money to fund facilities for criminals who are responsible for crimes, all while their real needs go overlooked. Lack of supplying adequate and proper proteins and nutrients to mental facilities, jails, prisons, and poor individuals ought not to be disciplinary action. Our society avoids building up individuals when they have commit crimes, instead, we go out the way to tear them down. Since both scientists and psychologists have been stating for years that certain facts support anyone's health needs fall within their deficiencies. The criminals who aren't responsible for committing crimes, get them on a high protein and nutritional diet. Or find out their dietary deficiencies, and give them high proteins and nutrients from those deficiency food areas to balance their feelings, emotions, moods, and thoughts. Then monitor their behavior for a minimum period of 5 years or a maximum period of 10 years. And obviously, this can be done in a facility or from the privacy of their own home. Everything comes at a cost, but it would cost less to supply them with the dietary deficiency intake than to incarcerate or house them in mental facilities, jails, or prisons. Inmates' health conditions. Solitary confinement is a form of segregation that jails, prisons, and mental hospitals use to house children, men, and women. Solitary confinement is a widespread practice and term those institutions use to separate an ethnic, racial, religious, or other minority groups from the dominant majority of which restricts access to entitlements that would commonly help strengthen development and growth. Inmates are considered to be locked up and locked down, in confinement. Prisons using segregation as a form of the punishment increases disruptive behavior in inmates, making their mental illness worse. This type of practice along with other harsh disciplines can leave a person's mind stuck back in time. Often inmates are put in solitary confinement due to behavior problems related to their underlying mental illness and histories of trauma. The vision is expected to deteriorate after inmates have had bad health conditions and traumatic brain injuries. However, inmates receive little treatment for mental illness. They receive psychotropic medications, and not enough of the types of medications that would ease their symptoms. Solitary confinement dramatically exacerbates acute psychiatric symptoms, often to the point of suicide. Those who are at risk of committing suicide are further confined, clothed in a smock, stripped of their belongings, and then forced to defecate and urinate through a grate in the floor. Making the solitary confined inmate symptomatic and unstable, prone to disruptive behavior and more visits to confinement. Those inmates are more likely to have bodily self-harm, and being isolated alone can lead to severe depression. Many inmates attempt or succeed at suicide. Harsh treatment can threaten anyone's tentative stability. Although there are groups such as protection and advocacy systems been in place since the 1970s, harsh disciplinary actions ought not to be still going on today. More than 75% of inmates are coping with both addictions and mental illness and more than 80% of inmates in prisons have a history of addiction. Inmates who have addictions and need long-term treatment won't get it. Supervisors are resistant to adding more patients to their caseloads. And supervisors refuse repeated requests when inmates ask for a sick slip. After that, they may be punished even if they say they are sick, and then it can result in less treatment. Although some prisoners manipulate the system, it makes it hard for others who need treatment. Prison clinicians appear to follow the protocol of performing those basic or normal medical treatment procedures. They may even arrange for continual treatment and send inmates off-site instead of on-site. But this will have very little to do with long-term treatment for addictions or mental illnesses. Even though there is a potential payoff in reducing recidivism of mental health and substance abuse for inmates. Our culture is ruled by aggression and fear, making acquiring treatment and therapy constantly harder to achieve. Many drug-addicted and mentally ill inmates are released without the basic supplies needed to succeed. Such as accessible medication, counseling for addiction, and oversight support. Not knowing what obstacles they will face, transitioning from inmate to normal life can too be overwhelming. More than 40% of inmates end up back in prison. Those who suffer from mental illness fail more than others and are likely to end back up incarcerated within three years. In 2014 studies showed inmates with both addiction and mental illness disorders were less likely than others to find stable housing or legitimate income. Making family support critical and more demanding after leaving prison. They become insecure, isolated, 
and at further risk of falling into alcohol and drug relapse. Revolving doors can be expensive when adding millions of dollars to states' budgets. Just keeping one person out of prison can save on an average $50,000 a year. Prison inmates have higher rates of mental illness, chronic medical conditions, and infectious diseases compared to the general population. Their conditions aren't considered serious enough under state criteria to get help from the Department of Mental Health in the community once they are released from state prisons. When services are not readily available in the community, behavioral health crises are often too treated as a crime. All this ought to be taken care of before the insane go to prison or after becoming an inmate. According to the CDC, data needed for the provision of medical and mental health services by type of services, and mechanisms used to deliver services to prisoners usually aren't available. If the nations want cultural change to the mentally ill-mounting litigation, change is possible for those who believe a system can work without greed. Such as Congress, federal agencies, mental hospitals, PNAS, the Bureau of Prisons, the Department of Correction Systems, and even the U.S. Department of Justice. Probation. According to criminal law, probation is a period of supervision over an offender, that is ordered by the court instead of serving time in prison. In some jurisdictions probation applies to a community or suspended sentences which are alternatives to incarceration. In other jurisdictions, probation also includes the supervision of those that are conditionally released from prison on parole. Either way, the offender is ordered to follow specific conditions set forth by the court, and often under the supervision of a probation officer. During the certain amount of time given for probation, an offender cannot break the rules set forth by the court or probation officer, otherwise, a violation can occur. But ordinarily, Offenders are required to abide by a curfew, live at a directed place, obey orders of the probation officer, remain employed or participate in an educational program, refrain from possession of firearms, and they cannot leave the jurisdiction. Also, probationers might be ordered to refrain from contact with their victims. This may be a former partner in a domestic violence case, potential victims of similar crimes, known criminals, or co-defendants. Besides, restrictions can include alcohol and drug usage or a ban on possession. The offender may be fitted with an electronic monitor or tag, that signals the movement to officials. They may be ordered to submit to repeat alcohol and drug testing or treatment, or even psychological treatment. They may be given community service work, and some courts may permit defendants with limited means to perform community service to pay off probation fines. Probation Statistics There were an estimated 4,537,100 adults under community supervision by the end of 2016. Down 49,800 offenders 1.1% from January 2016, that was on either parole or probation. Also, approximately 1 in 55 adults in the U.S. were under supervision by the end of 2016. The rate of adults on probation had declined during the period, down from 1 in 66 adults by the end of 2015, to 1 in 68 by the end of 2016. Parole rates also declined from 2015, 1 in 285 adults, to 2016, 1 in 287. Parole consists of a temporary release of a prisoner, who agrees to specific conditions before the completion of the maximum sentence period. Whereas the prisoner gives their spoken word as a parolee. Parolees are still considered to be serving sentences and are subject to return to prison if he or she violates the conditions of their parole. The specific conditions often include things such as avoiding contact with the parolee's victims, obeying the law and keeping required appointments with a parole officer, obtaining employment, not voting in an election, refraining from alcohol and drug usage. If a parolee has legal children, the parolee may also be required to show a cause of being a dedicated caregiver. There are other types of parole such as compassionate release or medical parole, and this releases a prisoner on humanitarian or medical grounds. Also, the U.S. federal system will place a defendant on supervised release after serving their entire sentence, but this is not considered as parole. In Colorado, parole is an additional punishment after the entire prison sentence is served, and it is called mandatory parole. Parole Statistics According to a survey done in 2017 by the Marshall Project, of the 2.3 million people who are incarcerated in the U.S., there were more than 61,250 technical parole violators. The findings only consisted of four state prisons for early 2017. These were people who were returned to prison for failing to follow rules for things such as failing a urine test, missing an appointment with a parole officer, or staying out past curfew. In such cases, prosecutors often sent the individual back into prison by revoking their parole. Rather than processing convictions, indictments, or sentence them for new crimes they have committed and were arrested for. They are held for a few months to a year, and not long enough for record keepers to get an accurate count. Alabama, Connecticut, Louisiana, North and South Carolina, Oklahoma, Tennessee, and Virginia, all stated that either they did not keep current state-level data or it would be too costly to generate. But generally, 
imprisoning fewer technical violators would help to reduce mass incarceration. Death Penalty Statistics According to Death Penalty Facts, from 1973 to 2018, over 155 people have been exonerated from death row with evidence of their innocence. The highest number exonerated by a state was Florida 27, Illinois 2 followed by Texas with 13. Since 1976 there have been 1,469 executions. Race and number of defendants executed, Caucasian 819, African American 504, Hispanic 122, and other 24. The highest number of executions from 1976 to 2018 by a state was Texas 548, Virginia 113 followed by Oklahoma with 112. Statistics showed the number of death sentences per year had dropped dramatically from 1999 to 2017. In 1998 there were 295 death sentences, and in 2017 there was a total of 39. Partly because severely mentally ill defendants cannot be executed, since it was found to be unconstitutional. There were 53 women on death row as of July 2017, this constituted only 2% of the total death row population. A total of 16 women have been executed from 1976 to 2018. An execution per state can cost anywhere from $400,000 to $24 million. The public opinion statistics have shown that the majority of people supported life without parole plus restitution, rather than a death sentence. Massive police shooting and statistics. The Federal Bureau of Investigation or the Attorney General compiles annual statistics of police use of excessive force, and so the annual average number of justifiable homicides is estimated to be 400. The Bureau of Justice Statistics for 2015 estimated the number to be anywhere from 930 to 1,240 per year. These U.S. killings by police and other law enforcement agencies included car accidents, custody deaths, gunshots, and a taser. And 125 or more were people that showed signs of mental illness. The FBI did announce a pilot program to collect numbers from police departments in 2017. While this isn't a nationwide pattern, it does occur in the U.S. Viral videos through social media show that the epidemic blood feud continues between dominant police officials and subordinate minorities. Four crime phases are contrasting idiosyncrasies, police, and researches that are used to compare criminal behavior. These idiosyncrasies continue to shock many researchers still today, even though they were created during the 1880s. One antecedent, fantasy or traumatic experience is the criminal needs to act out, as a victim or against others. Two body disposal, crime scene location, and it is the same place where the body was disposed of. Three methodology, similarities of victims such as physical appearance, profession, and proximity. The attraction to the victims, crime scene stages, weapons, wounds, and other details. 4. Post-offense behavior, interaction, taunts through messages, and copycat crimes. Also, any alterations of acts according to publicity.